Well, we've got a trending topic on property tribes, and that is, is it still possible to scale up in property, to go big, to go large in property? And to discuss that with me now, I'm joined by Stephen Johnson, MD of Shawbrook Bank. And Stephen, clearly, you've said before, we did have this golden era of low interest rates, free and easy finance. Mm -hmm. Those days are long gone now. So... What do you feel is the answer to that question about is it still possible to scale up quickly? And if so, what are the strategies that might help you achieve that? Yeah, I think probably if you look at the environment, it's going to take people longer to build a portfolio now than it did in the past. Um, yeah, the last four or five years, you've had quite high yields. Rents have done well and values have kind of appreciated a lot recently. So compressing yields. And when, when yields were higher, you can obviously... Um, you know, borrow against that yield principally um, and therefore you could probably, you know, gear up quite quickly. And as we move forward now, you've got interest tax relief changes. So, um, and you've got the consultation on affordability from the, the, the PRA and therefore, you know, lenders are going to be lending less uh, relatively to what they did in the past against sort of um, rent rolls. Um, so I think that's going to put a break a little bit on people. Um, and those people that haven't got lots of equity are probably going to have to find more equity to start to build their portfolio. So I think that, that dynamic is now, you know, life, I think. So therefore, the question, I guess, is if people can, can they create that equity, can they create that value in other ways rather than ride sort of an appreciating market, which people have really benefited from. Um, so I guess people have got to figure out those ways where they can find those properties, create the value, create, um, you know, take something that's unloved and refurb it into something that's mm -hmm. got a good rent roll and then refinance on the benefit of kind of an improved mm -hmm. income. Um, so I guess those types of strategies, which to be fair, most people have always mm -hmm. used and that's how they have built their kind of mm -hmm. equity, um, I guess is, is going to be increasing, well, is probably the route to, to, to growing a portfolio um, if you wanted to accelerate it rather than just wait for natural appreciation in the property values. Um, What's your view on joint ventures? Because, you know, people do say that if they combine their cash with somebody else's, that can help them to scale up more quickly as well. But you want to put a word of caution there, don't you? Um, yeah, I, I think um, I can understand why, you know, people combine their resources, whether it be skills and money or money, and you know. But I guess you just need to make sure that they, you know, that's documented and you know that there's a, a, a proper understanding of the commerciality of the agreement and it's fully disclosed to any lenders um, uh, and I guess it's just the stories aren't there where you know where those arrangements start off well intended mm -hmm. and don't work out like that because people's lives changes and things happen and or sometimes I guess there are also stories where you know that th they're not well intended at the outset and people have kind of you know been um, you know been I guess, encouraged into an arrangement that, that wasn't as what it appeared. So I guess you just got to be a bit cautious around that. But, mm -hmm. but, you know, it's a tried and tested model because generally there are normally skills that people have that other skills don't. And some people have, you know, the, have the necessary, maybe the money and the equity, but they don't have the time to or the contact or the relationships to find the opportunities. So mm -hmm. I just think it's, it's important to do it. The trusted partner that you know that's referenced and, and you know, things are, are, are documented um, and properly so there's no misunderstanding at a later date, really. Now what about some of these kind of more left of field strategies like, for instance, serviced accommodation? We're hearing a lot of talk about that. Is that a way to scale up quickly? Because I think too much is on focusing on the upsides of yeah. it and not looking at the possible pitfalls and yeah. the issues surrounding that kind of strategy. Yeah, so I think you know you could you could you could talk about serviced apartments the same way as you could talk about HMOs and other, you know, things that are that get headlines and profile because they're got a better yields or they on the face of it look like they're more attractive kind of opportunities but these are very different assets to a to a standard property mm. portfolio they behave differently they have shorter duration um, occupancy you it's, it's more like a trading business you have to manage occupancy levels you know you've got different cost profiles uh, you've got a market and you've got to kind of find a way to sort of get your occupancy levels up mm. Um, you've got different complexities around planning permissions yep. and licensing. You know the lending environment's different. Um, so I just I think I think all, all of these um, slightly more complex areas are all um, quite interesting. But but mm -hmm. people need to kind of understand that it's not the same thing as a as a straightforward buy to let. Mm -hmm. And if you think it is, mm -hmm. or it's being presented as if it is, and it's an easy way to sort of get a better return, then I think you know you're being slightly sort of you know. 
Naive? Maybe naive, yeah. Maybe you know, people are selling you something that isn't quite quite like that. And, um, and that's just my only word of caution. So, you know, for us with HMOs, we've, we've been at pains to point out that you know, it's a very different proposition. You yeah. need to really understand what you're doing. You need to manage your costs very differently. You need to, in many ways, be a social worker with a different tenancy you've got to manage. It's much more hands-on. It's, it's a much different, you know, it's a much different type of asset to manage. And service departments are again a different, a different, a different asset class. I mean, you know, at Shawbrook we support holiday lets, we support service departments, we do commercial investment property as well as buy to let. So we we operate across the spectrum. But um, yeah, my only word of caution is people need to really think through and do their diligence and understand what's involved in running those because they are more like a trading business than they are an investment portfolio. Indeed. So just to finish, if we sort of, you could look, get your crystal ball out and look forward five years, what do you think the kind of landlord of the future is, is going to look like? Do you see a much more professional sector? Yeah, yeah, um, I think, yeah, I think there is a risk that, that we will see more institutional money in, in the private rented sector. So I think part of the environment at the moment that's a little bit unsettling is there does seem to be a desire to kind of introduce city money to into buy to let and you know shifting it maybe away from the private landlord professional landlord and you know that that seems a little bit um you know is that really a, a, a nice trend and do we why why do we need that trend because you know we've got a, a professional landlord community by and large to do a very good job so why do we have to institutionalize that so i but I think that's happening. And we've already seen it in student lets, and I think we'll see it more in wider sort of build to rent type schemes. So we'll probably see greater institutional money in the market come 2020. I think it will favor the more professional investor just because the complexity of the market and the intricacies of all the different tax changes um, and you know the work that's going on with the regulator I think there are you know they're clearly differentiating between investors and professional landlords at the for property mark. Um, so I think that's being enshrined. Uh, and if the market gets a bit tougher, I think it's the amateur landlords that'll probably say, you know what, I've got, a, I've had enough, mm. you know, I've got enough. I'm happy with this one or two, or actually, I might sell it now. Mm. Um, but those that see the property as their business and as their trade and as their profession, um, I think will, will adapt to the environment. Mm. So yeah, I probably could see a, a, a larger concentration in that community. Mm. Do you think we've seen the end of the era of be a property millionaire in a year, or did that era never actually exist? Did it ever exist? I don't know. Um, I know someone would present that, but um, I think people have had, you know, the, if you look at what's happened, it depends where you've invested, but you've seen some quite rapid house price appreciation. Yep. You've seen very, very low interest rates and you've seen rents go through the roof. So, yes. you know, you have had easy a, lending, low deposit. Uh, well, yeah, post the crisis, liquidity wasn't flow, you know, wasn't around. But to be fair, you know, the rent levels and what's happened in house prices, um, if you if you had equity and you're a good, you know, you're a good landlord, I think, you know, you've had a really wonderful time. And, mm. and, and actually what we've seen now is as, as values have shot up, you know, rents are still going up, but the yields are getting squeezed. And when you go forward, lenders, basically your yield is going to be your constraining factor on what you can borrow. Mm. And yeah. whereas in the past it's been not a constraint, it's going to be a constraint mm -hmm. unless we see a big correction in house prices post-Brexit, but I don't believe we will. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if we're going to see a change in the TV programmes like Home, Homes Under the Hammer and all these kind of programmes that encourage people to get into property because it's not going to be as easy uh, as, as you say, when the house prices and people are making money through just through sheer capital appreciation. It'll be interesting to see. We shall see. Well, fantastic. Thank you very much for joining me. Pleasure. And uh, do check out Stephen's other videos on Property Tribes. We'll pop some links uh, below for you because we've been sharing a lot more information about the post-Brexit landscape for landlords. Thanks for watching.